Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, this session is called Keeping the Engines Running, Adapting Services and Addressing Customer Needs During COVID-19 and Beyond. My name is Marie Lawrence. I'm a research analyst in the Office of Planning, Research, and Evaluation in the Administration for Children and Families, and I'll be serving as your moderator today. Our session this afternoon is, I was going to say 70 minutes, now 60 minutes, and we'll spend that time discussing how programs have adapted their service provision during the COVID-19 pandemic in order to maintain and develop new connections with employers, as well as to respond to job seekers' health, substance use, and recovery needs. And we're going to explore these topics by discussing research from two ACF-funded research studies and then hearing from two practitioners, one who's been involved in each of the studies. Just for a tiny bit of context on those studies, um, the first one is called the Next Generation of Enhanced Employment Strategies or Next Gen Project. And the second one is the Building Evidence on Employment Strategies for Low-Income Families or the BEES Project. And together, NextGen and BEES aim to advance the evidence base by evaluating a wide range of employment strategies for people with complex barriers to obtaining and retaining employment, such as physical and mental health conditions, previous involvement with the justice system, um, limited or limited work experience. So the structure of our session today is going to be first to hear from all four of our presenters. Um, we have a researcher and a practitioner who've been involved in the NextGen project, and then a researcher and practitioner from the Bees project. And then we'll turn to a period of open Q&A with all of you. We highly encourage questions from you. Um, so please, while our speakers are talking, you can put those questions in the chat and I'll pull from them when we get to the Q&A period um, or when we get to Q&A. We'd love to hear from you directly. So you can just go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question at that time. Um, until then, we'd ask you to just keep your video off and your audio muted so that we can all hear and see the speaker as well. So um, with that, I wanna briefly uh, introduce our four speakers. So first we'll hear from Ana Lisa Mastri. Ana is a principal researcher at Mathematica and the deputy project director for the NextGen project. She has researched employment programs for people facing complex challenges to employment for nearly 15, excuse me, 15 years, and she's also worked closely with several TANF programs to develop and implement robust employer engagement strategies. Anna will be followed by Katie Wagoner. Katie has worked in the TANF arena for 17 years and currently manages the Families Achieving Success Today or FAST program in Ramsey County, Minnesota. FAST is the first program in the nation to offer IPS-supported employment to TANF participants. Next, we'll hear from Karin Martinson. Karin is a principal associate at APT Associates and is co-principal investigator for the BEES Project. She has over 30 years of experience conducting multifaceted implementation and impact evaluations of a range of employment programs and policies for low-income populations facing significant barriers to employment. And then finally, we'll hear from Matt Brown. Matt is the Senior Vice President of Administration at Addiction Recovery Care, or ARC, a network of over 30 addiction treatment programs across 20 Kentucky counties, making it Kentucky's largest provider. ARC has a nationally renowned comprehensive crisis to career approach to treatment that combines clinical care, medical services, life skills, soft skills, educational programs, workforce development, and job training. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn over the virtual stage to Anna Mastri to speak about employer engagement. Thanks, Thanks Marie. Marie. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Annalisa Mastri, and I'll be presenting today on some research that my colleague Jackie Kauf did about engaging employers during the pandemic. Jackie is on a well deserved vacation this week. Um, so, as Marie mentioned, the research is part of the NextGen project, and I'll just say a little more about that in just a minute. And the project is funded by ACF's Office of Planning, Research, and Evaluation, as well as the Social Security Administration. 
And our project officers include our moderator you just met, Marie Lawrence, as well as Gabrielle Newell and Sarita Barton. Next slide, please. So let me start off by giving you a quick overview of the NextGen project. NextGen is short for Next Generation of Enhanced Employment Strategies. And for this project, we're finding and evaluating innovative employment programs for people facing complex challenges to finding and maintaining employment. And what we mean by innovative is those that are going beyond traditional employment services like job search assistance and job placement and delivering either more intensive services or services targeted to people experiencing particular challenges like mental illness or previous involvement with the criminal justice system. We will be evaluating about five different programs for this project. Our research questions include learning about how the employment programs are designed and operated, how much they cost, and how effective they are at improving participants' outcomes, including employment and earnings outcomes, but also outcomes related to their health and well being. Next slide, please. So what do we mean by employer engagement or engaging employers? We'll just set the stage a little bit before we get into the findings. So it depends a little bit on the program and there are many degrees of employer engagement. So sort of a low level of engagement might be consulting with or seeking input or feedback from employers about their needs and what they are sort of generally looking for in employees. A more medium level of engagement could include working with employers to develop jobs for specific program participants, recruiting employers to participate in job fairs or hiring events or conduct mock interviews with program participants and encouraging employers to post job leads with uh, the program. A more intensive employer engagement could include partnering with employers to develop career pathways programs or occupational training to fill employer needs. Engaging employers is a really important part of many of the programs that we're evaluating as part of the NextGen project. And the pandemic made traditional ways of engaging employers, which were predominantly in person, difficult, if not impossible. So we set out to learn from these programs about how they were adjusting. Next slide, please. This presentation includes findings for a from a brief, which will be released soon on OPRE's website. And during the presentation, I'll describe a bit about how the programs adapted their employer engagement strategies in response to the pandemic restrictions and offer some lessons about adaptations the programs made that they will continue for the future. The findings are based on information that was shared between the start of the pandemic and March of 2021. And this included from conversations, sort of ongoing conversations between the NextGen project team and program leaders, and also some reports that program administrators use to track participant outcomes. Next slide, please. So let me tell you a little bit about the programs that we interviewed to arrive at these findings. The first is Individual Placement and Support, known as IPS, which is an evidence-based employment program for people with serious mental illness. We are evaluating IPS programs offered in mental health centers in Oklahoma, Tennessee, South Carolina, Illinois, and Iowa. And for the NextGen project, the mental health centers are focusing on individuals with previous justice system involvement. Families Achieving Success Today or FAST is in Ramsey County, Minnesota, and it serves TANF recipients with disabilities or those caring for people with disabilities. It offers a full family approach and includes IPS services for those seeking employment. It also provides mental health treatment for adults and referrals and advocacy for children whose parent or parents are in FAST. And then we also interviewed folks from Bridges, which operates in 12 cities nationwide, and about half of those are participating in the NextGen project. Bridges serves, serves young adults with disabilities, starting when they are preparing to transition from high school and following them along as they enter the workforce. And all these programs have a shared objective of matching program participants to employers in a way that benefits both. Next slide, please. So what did things look like pre-pandemic? Employer engagement was almost exclusively in-person. So for the IPS programs, their employment specialists made six or more face-to-face -face contacts with employers per week. That was kind of a performance metric and they were followed to ensure that they were meeting those targets. FAST is similar. Um, as I mentioned, it offers IPS services. So their career navigators, which are the equivalent of IPS employment specialists, were networking in person to develop jobs for their clients and also making lots of face-to-face -face contacts with employers. 
And then for Bridges, they have staff called employer representatives, and they visited work sites in person to assess employer needs, to assess the work environment, to make sure that it could be accommodating of youth with disabilities. And then after youth were placed at an employer, they would provide follow-on support in person to the young adults at the work site. Next slide, please. So during the pandemic restrictions, there was no in-person engagement with employers, but they saw continued success on um, um, the employment rates of program participants. So the ones that I'm showing here in this slide are employment rates of program participants that were reported by the programs to the NextGen project. So this is based on their own administrative data. The blue bars are the average pre-pandemic employment rates and the orange ones are after the start of the pandemic. So depending on the program, these could have been measured one to two months or some were even farther into the pandemic. But by comparing the heights of the blue and the orange bars for a given program, you can see only slight differences in the employment rates of participants from before the pandemic to after its onset. Next slide, please. So how did they continue to have such positive participant employment rates after the onset of the pandemic? Next slide. So in this uh, brief and presentation, we're exploring how the, employment, the employer engagement strategies that the programs adopted may have contributed to those pretty stable employment rates over time. So first, the programs leveraged the benefits of virtual communication. Programs reported that employers seem to have more time for phone conversations or electronic communication like email or LinkedIn than they had for in-person visits. Program staff reported a higher number of successful engagements with employers and opportunities to convey their message than when they relied solely on in-person visits. In addition, programs use virtual means to access a larger group of employers. Before the pandemic, when most employer engagement was in person, program staff focused on building relationships with employers that had a local human resources department but virtual options enable program staff to develop relationships with employers whose headquarters were outside of their region or even outside of their state. Next slide, please. Second, the pandemic prompted the programs to place even stronger emphasis on identifying and responding directly to employers' needs. For example, they posed direct questions to employers such as what are your challenges and how can my program help? Asking open-ended questions gave employers the freedom to raise the issues that were most salient to them. They also invited employers to participate in structured groups that regularly convened to provide program oversight and guidance. And this helped the programs gather information about employer needs and ways the program could best respond. Managers across the programs noted the value of conducting impromptu job development activities, even during non-working hours. So they gave examples like engaging employer managers and staff while picking up food from restaurants or grocery stores, or while on personal trips to retail spaces or medical appointments. And they noted that program staff could obtain really valuable information from these informal interactions. Next slide, please. Third, they expanded their networks by tapping into employers' networks. Longtime employer partners could vouch for the program and share success stories that then entice new, new employers to engage with the program. The programs also noted that new employer relationships beget additional introductions like a ripple effect. They reported that an ever-expanding network of employers that have connections with one another can form the basis of an employer community that collectively informs program strategy. Next slide, please. So moving forward, when the pandemic restrictions end, several of the programs envision a process sort of like the one on the slide. So using technology to make the initial connection with the new employer, building trust through an in-person meeting or meetings, and then continuing to use the employer's preferred way to communicate. So the quote on this slide is directly from one of the program staff who said, since our program is about solutions for employers and since hiring managers have many other responsibilities, they should be able to communicate in the way that's easiest for them. So there's this acknowledgement that in-person is not always the easiest way for employers to communicate. Next slide. They will also continue focusing on employer needs. One program noted that employers who thought the program understood their needs turned to the program first to replace employees who were furloughed or laid off and didn't return to work when businesses began to reopen. And they will also continue to expand their networks by tapping into existing employer networks. Next slide, please. 
Oh, I think you lost my last slide. Um, anyway, <laughs> it was just a contact page. <laughs> the brief will be released soon. Um, so feel free to reach out to me at amastri at mathematica-mpr.com. Um, you can also just find me, um, you can Google me or Marie Lawrence, our project officer from OPRE. Um, if you have any questions or would like for us to forward you on the link once we, um, once we have released the brief. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Katie Wagoner from FAST to share her on the ground perspectives of engaging employers during the pandemic. Take it away, Katie. Thank you, Anna. Hello, everyone. I think there's a slide for me. Yes, give it's, me one second. Yeah, it's just a picture. It's it's not a presentation. I'll just uh, start talking if that's okay. Um, so yeah. I'm Katie Wagoner. Excuse me. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I said just go ahead. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, and I manage the FAST program in Minnesota. Um, and as Anna said, to um, maintain part of IPS fidelity, each uh, employment specialist in, um, in, the, in our program, we call them career navigators, um, must speak in person to an area hiring manager six times per week. Uh, so in March of 2020, um, when the world shut down, that was no longer possible, obviously. So after several weeks of figuring out how to set everyone up at home and uh, getting them ready, we settled into our reality and tried to figure out how to do IPS virtually. And it was really, really tough. Career navigators were used to working or walking into businesses and introducing themselves and kind of um, almost like not letting people go until uh, they got an appointment. Um, and uh, there was much reluctance to cold calling or emailing. Zoom was new and scary. Um, and frequently at my check-ins with them, they told me they were having no luck at all. Um, they reported lots of blow-offs, uh, people answering the phone and would just tell them to go online and look at their openings or wouldn't connect to them to a manager. Um, but then came virtual job fairs. And uh, it took us a while to embrace them. They were new and scary as well. Um, but once, well, once the people doing the virtual job fairs got into the groove and started realizing how they could work. Um, one career navigator went to a virtual job fair and connected with two employers. And one was a bulk produce distributor and the other was a startup transportation company. And she later, she made appointments and later met one-on-one -on -one with them through Zoom with each company. Um, and she learned that the produce business was looking for a company to transport workers to their warehouse. And the transportation company was looking for new uh, corporate clients. And she learned uh, through just talking to them that they were working together on a partnership. So now she's recruiting participants to apply at the produce company and advertising that transportation option. Uh, we don't have a lot of people right now who um, are interested in driving for the transportation company, but we do have that in our back pocket. Um, and the career navigators also started using LinkedIn, which I, admittedly I'm not as familiar with, um, but uh, they said they follow fields, certain like certain fields like customer service or CNA, and it comes up with a list of local companies that have those types of jobs. And often there's a link to the hiring manager and a couple of career navigators have made first connections that way. Um, so we're working on that one. Um, and to get around the phone or virtual kind of awkwardness, or at least that cold calling that we weren't used to, um, almost all of the career navigators are starting out with um, asking employers, how has the COVID-19 pandemic affected you? And of course, people love to talk about themselves, including myself, I understand that. Um, so employers invariably open up and share their struggles. And it kind of shows that, that we care and that we, um, want to help them with a path to introduce job seekers. And, um, and one of the IPS tenants is kind of the very first time you meet with an employer, you don't ask about employer openings, you wait for that later. So it's a perfect question to have people just kind of unload their struggles and um, to be empathetic a little bit and to open that door for a second meeting. Um, we are slowly and cautiously moving forward, uh, moving toward meeting employers in person. Um, cold calling is getting easier and employers are eager uh, to find ways to fill those positions. Um, in many interesting interest instances, 
career navigators are finding it works better for a first contact to call or email rather than to stop into a busy business, which is, I think Anna talked about that in the, in the report, um, which was kind of the opposite of what we used to think when we thought if you went, you got a captive audience, if you walked into a business and they kind of had to talk to you, um, uh, that way they can set up a time to visit when it's most convenient and it just shows a little bit more respect for their time. Uh, and along with learning this new way of job development, career navigators have assisted participants in adapting. They help with Zoom app installation uh, and usage. They hold virtual mock interviews. One career navigator even attended a virtual interview with a job seeker from her own home. I think we will continue to use a lot of our new found skills. When the pandemic's over, um, we found some highly useful alternatives that we, we would not have found without that. Um, another thing that's really different from March, 2020 is that this is definitely a job seekers market. Uh, one we've not seen in a long time or maybe even ever. Um, one fast participant worked at a fast food restaurant for almost two years and she hated it, but uh, she was terrified to interview for another job. She was kind of, um, kind of fell into that particular job and uh, was just glad to not have to interview for it. So she thought that would never happen again. She really wanted a job working at housekeeping at a hotel. And before COVID, the career navigator was having a difficult time reaching a housekeeping hiring manager one-on-one -on -one to discuss the participant's interest. And last month, the career navigator called a hotel, got the housekeeping supervisor on the line, was able to tell her all about the participant and her desire to work there. Um, and with participants permission, she disclosed that, that uh, there was some high anxiety around the in interview process. They set up a time for the three of them to meet, not an interview, uh, just to chat about the work. And at that meeting, the manager simply told the participant about the job, told her the career navigator said great things about her and offered her a full-time position. Um, and just, it's just amazing because it was so difficult getting to a hiring manager of a department in a chain business was very difficult before COVID. Um, and we're just really hoping that's a trend for the future. Um, we've learned a lot of new skills and the job market is highly favorable to our uh, constituency. And uh, we're just so excited to move forward and hopefully come out of this at some point. Um, yeah, that's what I have. I want to thank Anna, Anna for sharing. I see I did it um, for inviting me to share a little about your um, about our experience with all of you. Thank you. Uh, Karen, I believe that you are next. Yep. Um, great. I'm happy to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about something a little bit different, which is some programs we're studying that focus on people with substance use disorders. Um, as I think many of us know, um, many communities are facing um, a crisis um, from the widespread misuse of a range of substances, including uh, opioids, other drugs, and alcohol. And low-income communities have been especially hard hit. Um, and addressing substance use disorders is a challenge for many uh, kind of programs. The slide. Next slide. Past studies have shown that employment is a really important element in helping people overcome substance use disorders. It can help people stay on the path to recovery um, by providing stability, wages, structure, and routine. Um, and it can also be a deterrent to relapse. However, we've also learned that substance use treatment on its own doesn't do much to increase employment, in part because people with substance use disorders often have other barriers to employment, like mental health issues, physical health problems, limited education skills, or justice system involvement. So in response, I think across the country, we're seeing um, programs that integrate treatment and recovery services with services to help people train for and find jobs have been more common, have become more common. And there's been no more resources, particularly at the federal level, going to them. These programs, which already served a very vulnerable population, faced unprecedented challenges in the, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, before the pandemic, the programs provided most, if not all, their services in person. And one of the biggest uh, challenges they faced was how to figure out how to keep operating uh, virtually. 
At the same time, substance misuse and overdoses were increasing significantly, and there were dramatic increases in unemployment and shifts in the local labor market. Next slide. So our study examined um, how these programs faced these challenges in the early months of the pandemic and adjusted their services. Um, and we looked at both um, how they adjusted their um, treatment and recovery services, as well as their employment services. Um, and we looked at, um, we did, we uh, included seven um, programs in the study and conducted phone interviews with them in the summer of 2022, um, or summer of 2020, sorry, um, you know, which is a little bit of a different labor market as Katie just noted that, that we're facing now. Next slide. Um, so this study, um, as Marie um, kind of went over, so I won't spend much time on this, is part of the um, BEES project. And much like NextGen, it's designed to build evidence on promising interventions um, designed to um, promote um, economic security and family well-being um, for populations facing barriers to employment. Um, and we have a particular focus on um, substance use disorder um, related issues. Um, it's also funded by OPRE and um, the Social Security Administration. And MDRC is conducting the study with APT Associates um, and MEF Associates. Our project officers are um, Megan Reed and Claire DeSalvo. And we also have a brief um, and a podcast um, that also features Matt and I um, that is on both um, the OPRE, MDRC, and NAP websites. Next slide. So we studied seven different programs in seven different states across the country. Um, and Matt um, is from one of them, ARC, um, in Kentucky, and can provide additional uh, information on their experiences. Next slide. All the programs um, we studied uh, provided employment and SUD treatment and recovery services, but did so in different ways. I'm not going to go through um, all these programs because they, they varied a lot in, um, in terms of how they were structured and who they targeted. But overall, four of the seven programs um, included people in um, provided services in residential um, substance um, treatment facilities, um, and all of them also provided um, uh, non-residential treatment and recovery services. And then each program provided its own mix of employment services, and these varied, but they included things like job search, connecting people to internship, internships, or providing occupational training um, in specific fields. Next slide. So first I'm gonna talk about some of the adaptations to the treatment and recovery services, um, just because they were unique. Um, in terms of how the programs had to adapt. Next slide. This slide presents some of the challenges uh, that I think were unique to um, providing services in this field. First, these programs were determined to be essential services during the pandemic and thus remained open. Um, programs had to determine how to keep participants safe from the virus um, and they had to shift to virtual services as much as they could. Um, but some of them were uh, residential facilities, so people were still living there. Um, in particular, clinical and medical services had to be provided virtually, which was atypical, and also raised privacy issues that they had to deal with. Um, a particular challenge was administering medication-assisted treatment. MAT is an evidence-based treatment for opioid use disorder and typically requires daily um, visits to obtain your dose, in-person visits. Um, and finally, the virtual shift was difficult because the cornerstone of many recovery services is the peer support you get from others through group activities. And these in-person interactions were lost. Um, and then finally, I think we also saw that uh, many people kind of didn't have the access to the internet or the devices they needed to, to, to go virtual. Next slide. So the programs made a lot of adaptations at once. Um, and kind of address these changes um, simultaneously. Um, 
they really did adapt quickly, um, as many places did, to address the physical um, safety in the settings through testing, quarantine spaces, um, social distancing, restricting common spaces, and kind of grab-and-go meals. Um, they did a lot of work to secure um, appropriate virtual platforms, um, many doing community drives to find um, devices for participants. Um, but establishing communities virtually was really kind of a key thing they thought about, given the importance of peer support and SUD recovery. So this not only included shifting from um, shifting group therapy and AA meetings, but also they developed social events um, to keep community, such as karaoke and Got Talent Nights, um, just anything they could think of to build community and maintain it. Um, they set up virtual clinical services through telehealth platforms, um, although this was kind of more common, were in places that had made progress on that prior to the pandemic. Um, and some actually established mobile apps for services. Um, ARC in particular uh, developed an app called ARC, Anytime, ARC Anywhere that Matt could tell you more about. Uh, restrictions on MAT were lifted so participants could receive their prescriptions um, weeks at a time with limited in-person appointments. I think most program operators will tell you this is one of the silver linings of the pandemic for them. And finally, we saw some new partnerships um, with hotels for quarantining, with medical agencies for testing, with food pantries for um, uh, arranging for um, uh, uh, you know, uh, resources for that um, and uh, kind of connecting to grocery stores to um, provide deliveries. Um, so that was kind of the range of issues uh, they undertook in that area. Next slide. Now I want to talk a little bit about uh, the employment services. Next slide. Uh, compared to the treatment and recovery services, these services actually moved somewhat more easily to a virtual platform, um, but still face significant challenges. Um, we saw that some of these services were suspended for a while, which gave them a little more time to um, adapt. Um, but there was a need to develop virtual training platforms and curriculum that worked online. Um, again, a lack of computers for both staff and participants was a key issue. The rapidly shifting economy with the high levels of unemployment in the early months of the pandemic required a rethinking of how people provided employment services. Um, and then you saw, as I'm sure we all know, um, some employment barriers were really exacerbated, particularly the need for childcare or the need to care for a sick family member. And finally, some participants had return, had real concerns about returning to work um, because of safety issues. Next slide. In response, um, employment services were able to resume virtually or sometimes on a hybrid basis um, over um, probably some did so in the fall. Um, some of the programs found that offering occupational training courses, um, they could provide similar content and that it was actually easier for participants to attend online because they didn't have to deal with travel logistics or could work around children's schedules. And that was one change some programs were thinking of maintaining. Um, some of the programs switched to more of a focus on job placement rather than training because unemployment was so high um, and participants needed jobs. The programs found um, that they were primarily able to keep participants in jobs, but they made shifts to the kinds of jobs people getting. Uh, not surprisingly, there was more demand for commercial cleaning, some construction, truck driving, delivery, but less for retail and culinary. There also a shift in the types of training programs people considered, again, because of the changing economy. And finally, the programs provided um, PPE um, to workers that needed it. Next slide. So overall, I think we really saw programs consistently responded quickly and creatively to address challenges that arose to the, due to the pandemic. Um, however, because 
COVID-19 is likely to be with us for some time, it seems. Um, you know, I do think um, kind of attention kind of to the long run implications um, is something we all need to think about. Uh, virtual services have become common, but the vulnerable populations served by these programs are less likely to have the technology and the skills needed to fully engage. So that's something, um, you know, I think different um, organizations are thinking about guidance and resources to maintain virtual service quality um, and kind of what that looks like. And finally, um, the economy has vastly changed since um, we conducted this study. Um, and that's, you know, a promising thing. Um, but I think there's still concern about the long run employment prospects for this group of um, participants that we looked at, um, I think kind of raised by some of the inequities um, caused by the pandemic. I think these programs are going to continue to adapt um, and to um, continue to address the, the needs of their participants um, moving forward. Thank you. Now I'm going to turn it over to Matt from ARC. Thank you, Karen. I'm going to now share my screen. And as I'm doing so, um, I just wanted to be just a, a bit interactive here as we get started and wanted to ask the group a question that's absolutely um, an optional question. But we're going to pop a poll up that just asked the, the simple question, do you know someone who has been impacted by addiction? One of the things, and you can just answer, you can either not answer at all, which is totally okay, or you can click yes or no on your screen there. One of the things I know for sure is I, I'm, I'm situated in Eastern Kentucky and we have facilities all across the Eastern half of the state of Kentucky. And what we have seen is a huge uptick in addiction and in relapses since the beginning of the pandemic uh, in March of 2020. So the name of our organization is Addiction Recovery Care. We're also known as ARC. And as you can see, we have a strong concentration of programs um, across the eastern part of the state of Kentucky. Uh, as you may have seen in the news, the United States saw a 30% increase in overdose deaths in the year 2020 versus 2021. I'm sorry, 2019. And what we see, and I just now saw the poll results, 96% of the folks who answered um, know someone that has been impacted by addiction. And that's kind of what I suspected. Uh, it's, it's actually, I believe the addiction epidemic is raging today more so than ever before. What we've been saying is that we're fighting an epidemic inside of a pandemic. Kentucky's overdose deaths raised 49% from 2019 to 2020. And, and my concern from what I'm seeing on the ground is that 2021 is probably going to be even worse than 2020. So as we look at the next slide here, um, Our organization has been around since 2010. This, this, this slide actually measures from 2010 to 2020. We've treated 16,780 individuals with substance use disorder, 10,000 of those in residential treatment and 6,000 of those clients in outpatient care. We have several different types of programs, but I wanted to highlight our largest facility and newest is Crown Recovery Care. It's located about an hour from Louisville and an hour from Lexington. It can hold 750 clients across four phases of addiction treatment in residential care for us. It was a, it was a college campus that had lost its accreditation in 2016, and we were able to convert it into a treatment facility where people are not only getting their addiction treatment, but they're actually receiving life skills, job skills, soft skills, educational, 
um, equivalence programs and are being, our goal is to help people go from crisis to career. Our organization is about 96% Medicaid in terms of its payer mix. I wanted to show you a quick slide here about the, uh, the drugs of choice that, and the change in drugs of choice that we've seen since 2015. Uh, I wanna draw your attention to in 2015, methamphetamine was 12.4% of the drug of choice of our client population. And that number has nearly tripled uh, last year to 30% um, drug of choice for methamphetamine. We, we treat the entire person and we have an acronym called ROPES and that is that highlights our holistic approach to care. So the R stands for recovery. We have a, a strong 12 steps program and we do a therapeutic community model of treatment. We have a strong opportunity component where people are receiving all the things that they may need in order to um, enter the workforce if appropriate after they leave our care. Like, so today we have over 100 people system-wide that are seeking a GED. We have 53 people who've received their GED since April. Physical health component with physicians, nurses, nurse practitioners, um, and, and a strong nutritional and exercise component. The E stands for emotional health with counselors, social workers, case managers, et cetera. And then we have a spir spirituality program that people can opt to either enter into or opt out of if they want uh, to be a part of our spiritual program. Very, um, a very optional piece of the program. We have a four phase residential component that builds on itself uh, and culminates at the year mark, but people can actually take one phase or two phases or do three phases or do all four phases. And the first phase is really stabilization, getting someone out of, the, out of their withdrawal and educating them on their recovery journey. The second phase is more about recovery skills and life skills. The third phase, they're practicing what they've learned. And the fourth phase is specialized job training. Over the last 10 years, we have created 900 jobs in our system. Half of our 900 employees are in recovery and 33% are people like myself who have graduated from the program. We offer uh, six different types of internship programs. Karin had mentioned that earlier. We have a food management internship program, a business office manager program, an automotive training program, the ASC certificate. We offer general maintenance, behavioral health technician, and we're also offering an art creative program for those that are skilled in, in music and in the arts. We have a fully functioning automotive garage, Second Chance Auto, where men and women can take the ASC certification and either be hired by us or other automotive garages in our region. We have a coffee shop and an art gallery and a lawn care company. And these are employment opportunities and training opportunities for our clients. Um, and now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop sharing and I wanna just talk about some COVID specific items before I close is, is at the very beginning of the pandemic, uh, addiction treatment services were thankfully deemed essential services. So we didn't have to close. We've been able to treat individuals with substance use disorder the entire time. Uh, we have um, unfortunately grown in that la in the last 18 months. So in terms of our census, and this is just from September 2020 to September 2021, our residential census has increased by 444 clients. So that's a 74% increase from, from where we were a year ago. We've added 524 residential beds in that same amount of time. One of the things that we started early on in the pandemic is we, we had a fledgling transportation department where basically we would come and if you needed a ride to residential treatment, we would come pick you up if we could. And then when, when the pandemic got kicked off, we really doubled down on our transportation department and we started to uh, pick everyone up and bring them to treatment because we were doing the, the temperature checks and the symptom, you know, asking people about their symptoms out in the field before we brought them to our facility to reduce the risk of COVID transmission. And what we realized is the more 
people that we came and got, the more people came to treatment. So our conversion rates went up because as we know, this population that we're treating, transportation is a, is a significant barrier. So in 2020, we drove 2,536 people to residential treatment. This year alone, we're already 700 and 747 more transports year to date today than we were the entire year of 2020. So we've driven 3,293 people to residential treatment. Karn had also mentioned that we um, developed or we, we had an app, the ARC Anywhere app, and we were able to transition our outpatient facilities to the app. And so people can get their counseling. They can see, do, do their individual and group counseling. They can do some of their medical provider visits on the app. And it also has a, a virtual community that, that allows people, it really looks like a Facebook feed and folks can, can go on there and post and see other people's posts of inspiration. They do have to still come in and see the physician at regular intervals if they are on medically assisted treatment. We also, and I've got a couple more points and then, and then we'll, um, we'll, we'll wrap up for questions. One of the other things we did is, so we're spread out across 22 Kentucky counties and we, wanted to be able to disseminate information to our clients and to our employees um, in real time and frequently. And so we created ARC TV and we uh, do, we, we film them at our corporate, at our home office. And, and twice a week, our clients get to watch a, a 10 to 15 minute segment during one of their uh, peer support groups that talk about all of the different educational vocational opportunities that they have ahead of them if they stay and want to enter those programs. And our employees get a once a month ARC TV episode talking about new benefits, new programs, new facilities, uh, so that we could keep that connection with them. We've been, we've really prided ourselves on that over the years. And the last thing I'll mention is that we also created opportunity fairs and we have a team that goes around to each of our facilities and they do job fairs at our facilities, um, telling our clients about the jobs that are available in their region, the internship opportunities that they have inside of the organization and making sure they're all aware of the GED program and our internship programs. So we really pivoted to the best of our ability. And when we've always, hung our hat on, on this saying for, as an organization, that employment is great medicine. What we've seen is that folks who stay with us for a significant period of time, commit themselves to the recovery process, see, a, see that glimmer of hope at the end of the tunnel, they often go on to be very successful individuals. And what we see is people that, that get, the job, get a job uh, with us or another entity a year later, we're seeing roughly an 80% success rate with success being defined as employed and in recovery up to three years after graduating treatment with us. So with that being said, I'll close. Thank you guys for participating in the poll and uh, I'll turn it back over to our moderator as we talk through questions. Wonderful, thank you so much for these really great presentations and remarks. Um, I want to make sure if you are in the audience and you have a question, please feel free to either drop it in the chat and make sure it's visible to everyone um, or feel free to unmute yourself and just go ahead and ask your question. Um, in the meantime, I'll just throw out a first question and I think um, Karen and Anna, you might have questions for your co-panelists too, so we will get to those as well. But the first question is, you know, Kitty and Matt, I noticed that both of you talked a little bit about management, um, you know, just working with your staff as they're navigating this very challenging experience. Um, Matt, you talked about ARC TV and kind of the internal communication being important. So I was wondering, could you just expand a little bit on what were some of the biggest management challenges you faced, um, which is a big question over the last year, year and a half. Um, and, you know, how, what are some best practices, promising practices that you've gleaned during that time. I don't know if Katie, if you wanted to chime in first. 
Sure, uh, definitely, definitely a challenge. Um, I had to figure out first. The challenge was to figure out how to um, manage people when they're all at home, and um, but I would say that I have some career navigators who on the team that are very, very outgoing and kind of risk takers and were ready to take things on and try new things and others that were just more traditional and kind of waiting things out and hoping to go back to normal. And we all kind of felt like that a little bit um, last summer, a little bit like, we'll just wait and then we'll all go back to normal and it'll be fine. And then when we realized it wouldn't, um, it was it was pretty tough. Um, it's not perfect and some a couple of people are still struggling, but I try to highlight kind of the, a successful use of some new tool by having a career navigator tell the team about it rather than me just saying great job and telling the story. Um, like when the career navigator I talked about went to the virtual job fair um, and uh, connected with the produce uh, distributor and the transportation company, I asked her to tell that entire story to the whole team, just to try to build up the morale and the confidence of the other people. Um, but that, that's just kind of something I, I try to do, but I'm not perfect at it either. Thanks, Katie. Matt, do you have anything to add on that question? So early on in the pandemic, we started daily meetings um, at 11 a.m. I remember them. I almost uh, dread thinking about them as, <laughs> as many as we did. We did daily 11 a.m. meetings with a significant portion of our leadership team to touch base on some key performance indicators and safety indicators that we had created to make sure that because, you know, just quite frankly, no one knew early on if you think if we all rewind back to March, April, May. We weren't sure if we were going to make it through to be here to continue to, you know, treat people with addiction. And so we kept everybody in the loop as much as possible. And one of the things we noticed is that our management team was talking about all the all the issues that our employees were having dealing with the instability and uncertainty of the pandemic. So we we created a program called ARC Cares, and we we rolled that out pretty rapidly where any ARC employee could access um, a, a life coach, a counselor, or a chaplain um, at, in, in a confidential manner. And we had tons of employees take us up on that for all three of those different avenues to make sure that we were supporting them through the uncertainty of the pandemic. And it's still a program that we have going on today. That's great. Thanks, Matt. Um, Honor, Karin, did you want to ask your co-panelists any questions? Well, I was just wondering, it, it seems, um, I just have seen in this project and well, some other work I'm doing that it's much more difficult to engage participants right now because people don't want to come in for services or um, they don't know about them or I, it's kind of unclear, um, unclear why, but I was wondering if you were doing any particular new outreach I think it's a time when people need services more, but they may be, um, you know, reluctant to want to meet new, you know, do any kind of program services. So I was just uh, kind of wondering if you if you've done anything on the outreach efforts. So for us, we did see a a large decrease. I don't. I think that was for me, right, Karen? Uh, yeah, it's for you and Katie. Okay, all right. I guess, and well, Anna can certainly jump in if she saw stuff and the other stuff she was doing. So for us specifically, we saw a, a big dip in people seeking treatment early on in the pandemic. Quite frankly, I, you know, most of what we do is residential treatment. We do outpatient, but the bulk of what we do is residential. And the thought of going and living with another group of individuals um, at the beginning of the pandemic was probably more than most folks could, could stomach. And then also jails were releasing people. The criminal justice system uh, definitely, you know, prior to the pandemic, 
if you were caught with certain amounts of drugs, you would, in a lot of places in Kentucky, were giving people the choice of either jail or addiction treatment. But when the pandemic occurred, they were just, they got a lot softer on crime, rightfully so, because they weren't wanting to overcrowd addiction treatment uh, facilities or jails. But one of the things we did to um, increase our outreach is for the first time ever, we got serious about uh, TV commercials. And we started, um, and YouTube over the top, um, YouTube ads and Netflix and Hulu, and we saw a lot of folks engage with us in that manner. I I did. Um, I'm just re was reminded. It's so it's a while back now, but I did a lot more. My this kind of goes with the management question as well. But I did a lot more micromanagement than I'm used to at all. Um, the career navigators uh, essentially were completely independent. They had to go out in the community, and I didn't know where they were or what they were doing for most of their days and then suddenly we were at home and some people were kind of stuck in a just a holding pattern and uh I just kind of less than a directive but would say I'd like you to contact 10 clients this week and see if you can have a zoom conversation with one of them or a or a duo or a facetime or whatever they have could you please try this one thing this week to try to connect with somebody um and I really felt like the staff were more reluctant to do that than participants were because they were learning Zoom because their children were having Zoom school and it was a little less uh, daunting than we thought. Um, but I really had to, in order to engage staff in this new technology, I really had to um, break it down step by step. And uh, just for a few people, some people kind of took it off and running, but. Um, and then to know that a phone call can be a meeting. We were doing a lot of, how are you doing? How are you feeling? We did a lot of checking in with people, making sure they were okay. And then suddenly realizing this is gonna be our life for a long time. We have to get back to doing IPS. Um, you can fill out a career profile on the phone. You can do these things. You don't have to just wait. Um, and uh, just same, going back to using the example of uh, a, a high-performing staff and just kind of having them tell their own story. Thank you. Ana, did you wanna ask a question? Yeah, I was just gonna follow up on what Katie was just um, explaining by asking Katie, if you could just provide a little bit more context maybe for the people who are in the session about like what a typical caseload size is and what it was during this period. And maybe it's still a little bit low, but um, the extent to which you think that what you've been doing is kind of scalable and you can continue on doing as caseloads are gonna start ramping back up. Sure, um, well, in one of the fidelity markers in IPS is that no one works with more than 20 people. So that is a huge thing. Even in the best of times, nobody has more than 20 people on their caseload. Um, which is manageable most of the time. I think our caseloads went down, um, but also in the IPS program, it's time unlimited. So we have people that want, that are been with the same career navigator for four years um, and some that get a job and decide not to be in the program anymore at, you know, within six months. Um, so the caseloads were relatively the same. Um, we might've gone down to 15 each person um, but it's definitely, definitely scalable. I think um, in the ideal world, uh, IPS caseload would have like half of people working and half the people looking for work. And so there are people who you're just talking to maybe once a month just to say, hi, how's your job going? And then the other 10 people are active job searcher seekers. So, um, and it doesn't always work that way. Obviously, there might be more people, you get busy times and down times. But um, I think one of the challenges was that it was so down and we had we had plenty of people working that it was a lot of just calling and seeing how your job's going and keeping the motivation up because we didn't have job seekers very much or we had people who left one job and needed another job but we already knew them really well and we're embarking now on we're about to get a lot more referrals um, through the next gen project and uh, we haven't met new people 
in a year and a half. And so I think that will be a challenge to with, um, get to know a brand new person because a lot of the people that we met in the last or that we worked with in the last 18 months, um, we already knew. We have very few people who we had to meet for the very first time virtually. So that, I think that'll be a challenge. Hope that answered that. Did, thank you. Um, you know, I'm looking at the clock and I'm not sure we have time for any more questions. Um, I wanna thank the speaker so much for sharing your insights and your research um, and for all of our participants today for joining this session and your engagement. Um, I know that there is an evaluation, um, I believe that pops up as a poll. Um, it's just six questions and the Office of Family Assistance uses that information to improve this meeting every year. So please do answer the poll questions. Um, it looks like um, Sujina has sent that out as a survey monkey. So please do participate in that. And with that, um, have a great afternoon. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>